I want to thank the uh, Maryland uh, Tech Council for the opportunity to uh, come here this afternoon and, and talk to you. It's, it's my honor to have Ms. Dorothy Essie with me here today. Um, my name is Sam Popa. I'm the Director of Clinical Services for Lung Bioengineering, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of United Therapeutics Corporation. Um, our headquarters is down the street, maybe not down the street, but a little drives away from here in Silver Spring, Maryland, and our company focuses on cardiovascular disease, in particular uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension. And uh, one of the things we know about uh, PAH is that um, some of the patients that are on our meds may eventually have to be listed for a lung transplant. So the work that I do within our operation in lung bioengineering is we work to try and increase the amount of lungs available for, for transplant. Uh, very briefly, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about the state of donation and transplantation in the United States because it's, it's kind of a dire picture. Um, currently, there are over 105,000 patients that are waiting for transplants in the United States. And even though in 2022 there were over 36,000 organ transplants that took place, um, there are still 17 patients uh, that die every day waiting for a transplant in the United States. Uh, another man, woman, or child is added to the, lung tr uh, to the organ transplant list uh, every 10 minutes in this country. And um, even with the 36,000 uh, transplants that took place last year, the list keeps on growing. Uh, when I look at the statistics for patients that are waiting for lung transplant or even patients that have end-stage lung disease, the statistics are even more uh, dire. Uh, last year, uh, there were only 2,600 lung transplants that happened in the United States. And over 80% of lungs that were donated were not used for transplant. We believe there's a, definitely a, a portion of those lungs that are out there that potentially could be used for transplant that aren't used for transplant. Um, so what we do at Lung Bioengineering um, is we work with uh, lung transplant centers east of the Mississippi that direct lungs to our facility for additional evaluation. So these are lungs that surgeons look at and believe potentially should not be used for transplant. Um, and they direct them to our facility. We have a facility here in Silver Spring, Maryland, um, and there's the, the picture up there. And we have another facility down in Jacksonville, Jacksonville Florida on the uh, Mayo Clinic campus. Um, so these lungs are directed to these facilities for additional evaluations. Um, when we receive the lungs, um, let me see if I can go to the next slide, there you go. Uh, when we receive the lungs, we utilize a technology called ex vivo lung perfusion to reevaluate them. So these are lungs that would otherwise not be used for transplant. We put them on the system. We circulate this bloodless solution through the lungs and then evaluate them for a period of three to six hours. And as the lungs are in our facility, we have a live feed to the transplant surgeons that are evaluating these uh, lungs to help them make a determination if they should be used for transplant. There's data that we collect. Uh, and share with the team. And the transplant surgeons that are evaluating these lungs are directing the procedure remotely um, because they could be from anywhere in the Mississippi um, and eventually get enough information to make a determination if the lungs are suitable for transplant. And I'm happy to report over 60% of the lungs that go on the system, and these are lungs that would otherwise not be used, eventually are transplanted into a patient. Um, so we're really proud of that, and our goal is really to increase the amount of lungs available for, for transplant. When I look at transplantation, I think transplant is, is, is a miracle anytime it happens. And I think one of the recipients of those miracles is standing next to me today. So uh, I'm thrilled to be on the stage with you uh, and honored to have an opportunity to have you share your transplant journey. Um, and um, I know that, that you have your, uh, your, your friend here with you as well. So I don't know if you want to introduce your uh, Micah to, 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 the, uh, to the folks and then just tell us a little bit about your transplant journey. Okay. This is Micah. He is my service dog. He has saved me many times before I got my transplant. He is my best friend. Um, and uh, good afternoon and thank you for having me here to share my story. My name is Dorothy Essie and I live in Aberdeen, Maryland. I was asked to attend this meeting and describe my experiences of a double lung transplant. I wrote up some thoughts so I wouldn't forget anything. I'm a Dutch woman born in Lima, Peru and moved with my parents between Holland, South Africa and South America and finally settled in the United States in 1962 and became a naturalized citizen. 
I have a husband that has been with me for 55 years. He retired from the Army after 26 years. I have three children and nine grandchildren, all living within a short distance from me. And Micah, my service dog, carried my breathing medications. We were all very active, hiking through the woods, boating, fishing, and crabbing, and our family activities. I've always had lung issues. When I was a child, I could not go to the altitudes of the Andes Mountains in Peru. I had complications from pneumonia and malaria. As we traveled as a young adult, I started smoking, which I'm sure did not help my situation. After multiple attempts, I finally quit when I was 58 years old. After that, during the seasons, my lung issues started to get worse. I was diagnosed with COPD, bronchitis, and asthma. And by, nine, by 2019, after an infection with the bird flu, I had to be on oxygen full time. I had difficulty doing most activities. Not being able to sew, not being able to garden, or even cook a dinner for my husband or my family and go on walks with my dog. As my condition worsened, my pulmonologist recommended me to the transplant program at the University of Maryland in Baltimore. I met with the transplant team at the end of September 2020, but they were slightly hesitant to accept me due to my age of 68. I had to work hard to convince the docs that as long enough that I was strong enough for a transplant. I told them that it shouldn't be based on a number and that I was strong enough to go through the surgery and that I would prove them that after the surgery, I would wrestle the docs to the ground. <laughs> they agreed to start the process which normally takes about eight to 10 months to complete the testing, all the testing. I completed the requirements in four months and my packet went to the board in February 2021 and I was put on the list at the end of February and told to maintain a go bag if I got called in. I remember them asking me if I, could ex if I would accept lungs from a high-risk patient. And I had no doubt in doing that. Along with this, mentioned that the lungs would be placed in a machine to be cleaned and washed. We continue to pray that the process would be successful. According to all the lung groups that I have talked to, I was expecting to wait six, 10 months or longer. But three weeks later on St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, 2021, at 8.55 p.m., we were ready to go to bed and I got a call, I received a call from the transplant team. They said, Dorothy, this is transplant team. We have a gift for you. Are you willing to accept it? I was ecstatic. I was so excited. Then they said to proceed to the main hospital in Baltimore. We got in that night, went through the pre-op and waited till 5 a.m. in the morning when they took me to surgery. It was a surgery from about 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., around nine hours. On the day that I got the call, we had gone to Panda Express for lunch. And with the meal, I received a fortune cookie. It read, your troubles will cease and good fortune will smile upon you. That proved to be so very true. The next day after surgery, we removed, they removed the breathing tube and in less than 20 hours after surgery, I was up and walking a few steps 
and the tubes came out with tubes coming out of all parts of my body. I talked to others that had transplants and they said they were in the hospital for months and longer. I was determined to get out of intensive care, the hospital, and the hospital. In two weeks, on April 2nd, I was on my way home with no tubes, no breathing, now breathing full breaths, and no problem, and no oxygen. The transplant team explained to me that part of the transplant process, lungs had I received, had been placed in this machine. That they had mentioned, and I, would, I believe that one of the reasons that helped me so rapidly recover is almost, with no, almost no complications. Sorry, I shake on medicine, <laughs> so I apologize. You're doing great. I pray every day for the young man and his family that provided me this new life and the ability to continue activities with my family and friends and my mica. I was actually able to run slowly, but run around 50 feet down the sidewalk with Micah a couple of months after I got home. My neighbors were amazed. It'll be two years in March, and I feel great. In less than four months of my transplant, my husband and I planted a full garden. I've canned over 35 cases of jams, of fruits, and vegetables. I hiked through the mountains of Maryland and Pennsylvania. I bought another Pernina sewing machine to add to my collection. I fished on the Bush River, and I had taken many walks with my husband and Micah. A last week, I went shopping with my daughter and my granddaughter for her senior prom. This is something I would never have done. I pray to others will be able to receive a gift for new life with new lungs. I believe the machine helped me and will increase survival for many. Please support other achieve this, others achieve this gift to experience a new life and thank you. So, Ms. Essie, I have to ask a few questions. Sure. So, you know, I may have stepped on, I'm sorry no, about that. that's okay. <laughs> Talk to me a little bit about what it's like um, as someone that has end-stage lung disease. What is your day-to-day -day life like before transplant? I know there's a lot of medications, there's oxygen, but just tell me a little bit about what it's like with, with end-stage lung disease. Well, with end-stage lung disease, which was... Um, two years ago, I, I was not able to um, go places. I was not able to cook. I could not do dishes. I have always cleaned my own home. I never had a maid to do it. I could not clean my floors, clean my home, make my bed. I depended solely on my husband. He did everything for me. I was lucky if I could. I could make it down the stairs was not an issue, but I couldn't make it up. There were times when my husband used to have to take me in my wheelchair and wheel me around the garage, down the path, to where we slept in the basement. We slept in the basement, we created a bedroom, it was cooler for me. I could breathe better. All my machines were down there. Um, I gave up sewing, which I loved to do. I gave up mushroom hunting, which was one of my favorite things to do. Um, the stress that was put on my lungs, it was so hard. I could breathe in, but imagine not being able to get that air that you just took in. Take a deep breath and try to blow it out and nothing's coming. You are literally suffocating within your own body. And there were times I would have severe panic attacks because I couldn't breathe. 
At one time I had such a severe panic attack, I had a heart attack at the same time. You don't ever realize not being a recipient or going through the process as a normal human being, which I was for many years, that when this stage hits, you don't feel like you're going to survive. I was blessed to have him. And a small story, I was very ill. I was not realizing I had my heart attack going on. We called 911. They showed up at the house. This is a miracle dog. He's amazing. They showed up at the house, and they diagnosed me with having a heart attack, and they were going to take me out on the gurney. He said, no way, you're not taking her. I mean, I wish he could speak, but he doesn't. <laughs> but they said, no, you're not taking her. I have a little nightstand next to my sofa, and it has wicker baskets. In there are my nebulizers, all my medications, my breathing machines, my CPAP machine, everything that I was on was in there. I had tried the CPAP, I had tried everything, it would not go away. I could not get air out of my lungs. <coughs> they showed up, he was adamant. He took the drawer, pulled it out, <laughs> and said, no, this is what mom needs. Here are the medications. Here are all the equipment that mom needs. And dad said, Micah, it's OK. They're going to take care of her. No, it wasn't OK. They didn't like the ambulance coming. He didn't like the men in there taking care of me. That was his job. <laughs> so we took off, and my husband followed, and we left him home, which is unusual to do. But we left him home until I got evaluated. He pulled the rest of the drawers out, pulled all the nebulizers, all the CPAP machine, all the equipment. He pulled it out of the drawer and put it on the floor. Literally, it was on the floor. My husband got home. All my equipment was laying on the floor. This is what she needs. My husband then brought, her to, brought him to me at the hospital. He jumped on the hospital bed, licked my face, and said, you're going to be OK, Mom. You're going to be OK and he has never left my side. That's great. Great companion to have. I think yes, he knew. It yes, it is. Tell me a little bit about, you know, I think it's kind of an, and I've never experienced so I'm asking you. It seems like it would be an emotional roller coaster to get the phone call because it's never guaranteed that you're going to get the transplant, right? They no, tell you. Not. No, it's not guaranteed. Even when you go to the hospital, it's not guaranteed that that is your lungs. So. When you're put on the list, you're ecstatic, you're excited. Now comes the waiting period. Mm -hmm. And every night we prayed and prayed hard that we would be next in line for the lungs. And my children, who were one of my main support group people, they said to me, Mom, it's coming. I have the faith. It's coming. That night, when I got a call, it was like, I said, I've got to answer this. This is transplant. It's almost 9 o'clock, and we're on our way to bed. And it takes a while for me to get my process, get my oxygen, get my machines going, the whole nine yards to get into bed. And my husband stood there next to me, and we answered the phone. And that's when they told me it was transplant. I started to cry. I said, this is my turn. But it's not necessarily my turn because you can wait months and months and months and you never get a call. Or you get a call, you go down, and they'll say, Mrs. Essie, after four hours in the hospital, the lungs don't fit you. We have to give them to another recipient. And it's, they call this a dry run because they don't want you to get upset if you don't get it. But it's very discouraging if you don't get it. I've met patients that have been turned away two to three times. But you got it on your first shot. I got along my first shot, and the doctors actually told me, Sam, that they believe very strongly because these lungs went through the cleaning process of your machine, as Dr. Krupnik said, and Dr. Iacona, the lungs went through the process of being cleaned. They could detect. Now, I don't know how, the lungs, how those machines work. I'm not a technical person. I just know what I was told. 
that through that machine, they could detect minor complications or problems that would not be suited for me. And then when my lungs went through that process, they said, no, that's a perfect match, 100%. But if they had not gone through this process of being cleaned and washed, there would have been a very good chance I would not have received lungs because they cannot rule out all the fine details of what's wrong with the lung. I might still be sitting here or I might have been dead. So I am very grateful for what I have received. One final question for you. When they remove the breathing tube and you get a chance to take a, your first couple breaths, talk to me a little bit about that. Because I think prior to that, it was just the challenge of, of completely getting the, the breath to go out and, 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 and chest pressure. Talk to me a little bit about what it's like to take that first breath afterwards. When they told me they were taking the intubation tube out and, and um, I was going to be able to just easily breathe and I did not believe this was gonna be a process. I sincerely thought, oh, they're gonna slap me full with a tail again. <laughs> um, my oxygen's gonna be dragging for a while and I won't be off of this right now. When I got pulled off that machine, I felt exhilarated. I felt like the world had changed. I told my husband, I said, honey, I can breathe. I said, it's not getting stuck. I'm actually breathing like a new human being. It was amazing. That's great. Yeah. I don't have any more questions for you. I wanted to, to, to thank you for taking time to, to come out and, and share your story. It's a remarkable story. It's, you know, like I'd mentioned, I think transplant is a miracle anytime we have an opportunity. It is. It's an amazing miracle. Yeah, it, it's, it's wonderful, and, and we're thrilled to have had an opportunity to, to, to play a part in your, in your transplant journey. No, I am grateful for what you, you people have done for me. Um, I would not be here today. I strongly believe that. I was at end stage. And, um, you know, I, I see people now on oxygen and I pray for them because I know what it was like. Or I'll help them in the store and say, honey, I've been there. You know, can I help you? Um, this is how I feel before the transplant, Sam, as I was younger. I, I, my, I'm on the donor list. I have been on the donor list for years. But it never sunk in what the donor list really is, or how it affects somebody's life. Sure. It was very nice. I, the, today was the first time we got to meet in, in person. Yes. Yes. Um, it's, it's wonderful to get a chance to meet you and see how well you're doing. It's very nice meeting Mike and your wonderful husband, John, um, who I think has been an incredible help to you. And, Definitely. And it's, it's, it's wonderful to get a chance to, to, to have you come out and, and talk to us about your transplant story. So thank you very much. And thank you for your attention. Um, in, in listening to the story. Yeah, thank you. Thanks.